morning. Hello everyone and welcome to the Faculty of Classics. My name is Edith Johnson and I'm the Outreach Officer for Classics at Oxford, dedicating my working hours to raising awareness of classics and encouraging folks to apply for our degree courses. We're delighted you have joined us for this live stream question and answers, focusing on our joint schools courses, that is Classics and English, Classics and Oriental Studies, and Classics and Modern Languages. Here to answer your questions, I'm delighted to introduce our panel, starting with Gail. Would you like to say a few words? Hello, I'm Dr Gail Trimble and I'm the tutor in Classics, that is Language and Literature at Trinity College. Uh, and Ezra? Hi, I'm a third year student at Brasenose College and I do Classics and Oriental Studies um, and my language is Arabic. Thanks Ezra. Moving on to Eliza. Good morning, I'm Eliza. I'm in my second year, well I'm going into my second year studying Classics and French at Christchurch. Great to have you with us. And Justin? Hi there, I'm Justin. I'm studying Classics and German and I'm just coming into my fourth year, so I'm on my year abroad at the moment. Brilliant, thanks Justin. And Anisha? Hi, I'm Anisha. I study Classics and French at St John's College. I'm about to go into my final year, so I've just come back from my year abroad. And so any questions on classics and French, feel free to field them my way, or Eliza's as well. <laughs> oh, well, it's brilliant. Thank you all so much for giving up your time studying and teaching and uh, to be with us. And let's see if we have got any questions. So I've got one coming through. It says it's anonymous, but what they're wondering is, what is a typical interview process for a student who's doing a joint classics course? So I suppose, how would it be different from single honours? Maybe I could start off with that one um, and because I've, I've got a little bit of, of, of an overview and it's a bit different for the different versions of the course um, but for classics in English and classics in modern languages um, the important thing to bear in mind is because um, English and modern languages are quite sort of literary subjects in Oxford um, often in your classic interviews too, there'd be an, an, an emphasis on the literary side of the course, just as there is in the course itself. Um, so in my college, whereas for people applying for just classics, we tend to give them one interview on the language and literature side and one on the um, ancient history and philosophy side. For people applying for classics in English, classics in modern languages, um, it tends to be just the language and literature side, and then they'd also have interviews in English or modern languages. Of course, you do have interviews on both sides of the course, English and then modern languages, oriental studies, um, or, or, yeah, or whichever one I didn't say. Um, and so um, uh, it's, it's important not to overburden you with interviews while still getting a sense um, of your potential in both sides of the course. But that's only an overview. I'm sure people's experience is, is slightly different in different colleges. So would anyone like to tell us about your, your uh, joint school interview experience? I, I would love to. And the first thing I'd want to say to any prospective students is just don't worry. Like, please don't worry about it. It's certainly I know there's sometimes this misconception that applying to uh, joint schools with classics is more difficult than classics. I don't think that's the case. I think if you want to do it, absolutely do it. Um, like Gail said, my interview process was pretty much as she described. So I applied to John's. I had so one classics interview at John's and one French interview. The classics interview was so I don't know how familiar our prospective students will be with just the general interview process. So I might over explain that a bit, but I'd rather err on the side of over explaining than uh, under explaining. Um, so. Uh, essentially what happened for me was that for the classics interview they gave us an extract of a text um, before the interview and we just had to look through it um, so for John's they gave me a few hours I then had a classics interview at Trinity and a French interview at Trinity and they gave us an extract just 20 minutes before the interview so that can vary but essentially they just want you to look through it you know come up with some thoughts like it's going to be something very kind of it's not going to be something you've read before in the interest of fairness it's usually something quite obscure so don't worry too much about it just look at it any thoughts that come to your mind jot them down and that was the first part of my interview and actually classics and modern languages are similar in that way you'll probably have some a little a short I, I stress like something very short to read before the interview and then the interviewers will just maybe ask you oh what did you think about that some easy questions and then maybe some more kind of pressing questions based on what you say and then the rest of the interview is 
well, at least for me, was just asking about my personal statement in both cases. And a, a little kind of fun um, fact, I guess, or a little fun insight is that I think, so my classics interview, they asked me about what was on my personal statement. My own languages one, they asked me what was on my personal statement, which included the classical text. So I had a French kind of interviewer actually ask me, oh, what did you think of the Aeneid? And I was kind of very <laughs> surprised by this, but actually with modern languages, because you're not expected to have read kind of, you know, any, if at all, kind of modern languages texts, they might just ask you about, um, you know, how your experience is with classical literature. And there's a lot of crossover. So I feel like I've, I've talked a bit too long here, but um, yeah, my main takeaway would be, be, don't worry, you know, you're talking about something that you love and that you, you're good at with kind of professors who ultimately like they want to they want you to be your they want you to succeed right they want you to kind of bring your best self to the the interview so I would just absolutely don't worry go in with a calm mindset it's easy for me to say because I've done the interviews but like that would be my main kind of takeaway yeah just to add like Anisha's done a really thorough summary of what she had for classics in French so obviously it's basically the same for me but I also, I had um, for classics, instead of a literary and language interview, I had the philosophy and ancient history one, which was a bit of a curveball, given that I'm doing French and classics, which is the more literary course. But it was actually a really good fun, like it was a really fun interview. Uh, and it was like kind of problem solving type thing. So like, I don't know, just, I was super nervous when I went in personally, but just like, as Anisha said, just enjoy yourself because it is quite a good experience. If I could just, Footnote that I think it's really important to point out in any interviews, but it particularly comes up when we're talking to people applying for classics. If they are sort of, there might be an idea that might be interviewed by a philosopher or an ancient historian. We know that most people applying for classics or any joint courses have not had the opportunity to study those bits of classics at school, even if they have been lucky enough to study Latin or Greek or classical civilization, which obviously, again, not everybody has. Um, so interviewers are very much um, aware that they're looking for potential and they're not assuming um, previous knowledge unless you've said in your personal statement that you love Plato or something. Yeah, it wasn't technical philosophy, it was just like sort of problem solving type thing, like logic, as opposed to do you know like Socrates or whatever. Just, yeah. Oh, amazing. We've, um, we'll move on to someone else's question now. We've got one from Lucindy. And in fact, Lucindy's asking two questions. So with classics in English, is the English both literature and language? And I'm the only person here with sort of precise knowledge of classics in English, aren't I? So I'd, I'd better say something about that. Um, essentially, um, a bit like classics at Oxford has quite a lot of language to it. Um, English at Oxford has quite a lot of language to it. Um, but obviously, if you're doing a joint degree, you're only doing half the numbers of, of papers in, in classics and in English. Um, so... Um, on the English side, you wouldn't be doing quite as much of the sort of linguistically based kind of old English as um, people doing the English course do. If anybody knows differently from, from experience of their friends doing this course, please do, do come in. Um, but that's my understanding. Um, however, you do still have, uh, I think, have to, um, as, as an introductory part of English, um, the English side of classics and English prelims, um, do some rather wonderful papers on sort of um, the, 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 the use and theory of the English language, which is much more to do with sort of how is the language used, why is it developed in that kind of way, and so on. So it's not really like sort of learning another language, which Old English basically is, in the way that in classics they're sort of quite good at. You do have the kind of linguistic side of English study a bit, um, as well as it's, it's mostly a literary degree on the English side, just as it is on the classic side. I hope that makes sense coming from a, I mean, you know, if we had an English tutor, they'd be able to tell you more. And perhaps you could um, ask one of those on another bit of the open day. But that's the basic answer. And the other part of Lucy Indy's question, I don't, we're none of us are Oriental experts, are we? But I, just, I, oh, Ezra, perfect. <laughs> what is Oriental Studies? Uh, yeah, so it's um, the blanket term for um, the studies uh, sort of of the uh, eastern uh, side of the globe, which is actually um, currently under review with the faculty and they are trying to come up with a different name because it does have um, connotations that aren't, aren't really desirable um, nowadays. But basically, um, with classics and oriental studies, uh, you sort of follow the course for classics and then in your uh, third and fourth year you pick up an oriental studies language so I chose Arabic but you could choose um, Aramaic, Armenian, Egyptian, Hebrew like I said it's a very very uh, sort of broad umbrella term for lots and lots of different uh, languages and cultures that you can study basically. And it's perhaps worth saying that that some of them are 
ancient languages like Latin and Greek that are not spoken anymore, like Sanskrit, and some of them very much are spoken in large parts of the world like Arabic. So again, it, it, it's a broad umbrella. Okay. And so I was looking at this one here, it's just come through. With classics and modern languages, it's from Anonymous, what is the balance between learning classics and learning, say, French or German? So how much time do you spend on each one? Yeah, this is just a prefix. I'll let Justin answer this one, but just to prefix this with there are two versions of the course. So um, I do the version of the course where, and if, if you look on the classics uh, faculty website, I believe we updated our table recently. Um, so there's a bit more information on that, but just to prefix it with, so I do a course where I did classics mods. Uh, so for the first two years, essentially did a classics degree, then did a 50-50 split. Um, classics and French. I believe Eliza did the other version where you do kind of classics of French straight from the beginning. So it's a 50-50 split from the beginning. And Justin is going to tell you the version of the course he did because I don't know. Um, yeah, so I'm basically, um, so I'm also mods route. Uh, so it can be a little bit mad, but it's really enriching. Um, so yeah, basically the two streams are you can either start off with like what's called prelims um, or you can do like mods like a regular classicist with a bit of modern language on the side and then go splits for your finals. Um, in terms of personal experience, uh, it, the workload's a bit heavier if you do do mods route because you kind of have to keep juggling your language along until you go splits. Uh, but if you could just clarify, because the students might not know what mods or prelims are. Oh yeah, okay, sure. Um, so mods are sort of your first exams in classics. Um, and uh, there's different versions for whether you've done uh, Greek and Latin before. So I hadn't. Um, I'm from a sort of state comp background. I turned up, with, so I had German at A level, but I didn't have Latin or Greek. So I started off uh, with Latin from scratch and I did five terms of just being like a regular classicist and having um, sort of modern languages stuff on the side just to keep it ticking along. And then in, in, fine, in sort of after those first five terms, I kind of diversified, diversified out and started doing a bit of a sort of more balanced course. Um, I don't know much about the prelim side of things. If um, anyone uh, here has done, then it'd be, I guess, great to hear from them. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. Um, classics in German is a little bit of a rare thing. There's only a few of us knocking around. I think I found about three. But that basically means also when you're applying, uh, tutors are just really interested, like, you know, what can you, you really can bring new things to the table as a joint honour student. That is basically just really fun. Eliza, yeah. do you want to say to do up for limbs? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I did the other option, which is um, I had exams after, like at the end of my first year, rather than in the middle of my second year, like Anisha and Justin. Um, and I had, so I've obviously only done my first year, but it was half and half split pretty much exactly for that whole time. So I did literature for... French and for classics and I did language for both um so I only did Latin um as the language and I'm picking up ancient Greek after so at the start of this year um so it was a lot more balanced that's why I picked the option I did because I wanted to keep French going for like properly um as part of my studies as, as opposed to like on the back burner because I didn't know if I'd be able to keep it up or have the motivation but I think doing the mods route for classics which is the route where you do exams after um, in classics only is really interesting because it gives you a chance to go more in in depth into classics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's perhaps worth. I mean, the, there are lots of different versions. Just look very carefully at the table and work out which version is is the one for you. And perhaps just two principles to think about are the mods route, including the year abroad, takes five years. It's a four year course with a year abroad. Um, the prelims route, including the year abroad, takes four years, three years in Oxford and one year abroad. Um, and the other difference is all these subtleties are basically to, a large part of it is how much language you do when, um, especially on the classic side. Um, so it depends which languages you've, you've already gotten and how much you want to do. And if you do mods, then you do Latin and, and or Greek um, in a bit more depth. Um, and finally, um, as um, I think Justin said, um, classics mods will have more of where we sort of began on this, this live stream, the, the things that aren't literature in it. So if you think you're, you, you know, you really want to keep your modern language up, but you'd also quite like to spend a bit of time doing classical archaeology, maybe look at the mods route and see, see what that would offer you. 
Thanks. Also, just a final thing to add, because it is quite complicated, you can fully ask more questions. So in, in, even when I went for interviews, at the end of my interviews with Johns, when the tutors said, oh, do you have any other questions? I actually did ask questions about the structure. I kind of asked questions about, you know, the possibility of learning linguistics with the different courses. So don't be afraid. I, I didn't actually have to decide which version of the course. I know you apply for a specific version, but I don't think they even asked me which version I wanted to do until a few weeks before starting in first year. So definitely, if you have any more questions about your specific kind of wants and kind of things like that, you can ask them at the end of your interview or just email a college or email a professor and or email us. I'm sure you have access to our emails, I hope. Um, so, yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions because it is, as we've established, a little bit complicated. But don't let that scare you off either. <laughs> uh, now, I think this next question will be really quick. Does not studying ancient Greek at A-level reduce your chances of being accepted? No, 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 I don't think anyone <laughs> okay. um, The only thing I would add is, uh, so yeah, again, to reiterate, I don't think any of us study ancient Greek at A-level. I do think if you can show some evidence that you've tried to learn some Greek, um, that is absolutely fantastic in interviews. So uh, there, there are several books you could, I would recommend John Taylor, Greek to GCSE. That's one I used. Um, I think there's Reading Greek is another one the faculty used to use. I'm not sure what they use now, but even just kind of going online, learning the Greek alphabet, learning a bit of Greek, if you can put that in your personal statement and just, just to show that even though you haven't had the opportunity, because it's just not out there, right? It's not your fault that you haven't had the opportunity, but any kind of evidence that you've started to learn Greek, just because when you do start, if, if you're going to do Greek, um, you don't have to with kind of joint honours, but um, if you're going to do Greek, it is quite like, you know, you hit the ground running. So any evidence you can show to your tutors that you've learned a bit of Greek before Oxford is just, it will go a long way. So yeah, I would recommend. But again, you, you, you don't have to. And with joint schools, it particularly, um, there are plenty of people who come, I, either, either have Latin A-level and do a version where you have Latin A-level, but not Greek and you just continue with Latin and your modern language or English. Um, or don't have A-levels in either language. This is extremely um, common too. Um, and then um, as um, Justin was explaining, uh, learn one of the classical languages. There are various different versions of the course for doing that um, and have um, English or modern languages alongside. So if you're in the position where you've done Latin and you want to add in Greek, then Anisha's advice is sensible, but it, it, it depends what you want to do. Um, and yeah, it's absolutely very important that um, not having not having Greek available, not having Latin available, does not decrease your chances of being accepted because we know that opportunities to to, to, to access that vary a lot. Exactly. Thank I guess you. it's also worth just um, throwing in that you can also get through your entire course um, without touching Greek with a barge pole, if you so wish. <laughs> um, so what, uh, one of my flatmates oh, I live with, he's a straight classicist. Um, he didn't do Latin or Greek. Um, so like me, we both did Latin together. Um, but he he loves concrete. He loves uh, urban settlement design. Um, he's a bit of a philosophy nut. Um, so he's just been kind of he. So he's done Latin for mods, uh, but then he had absolutely no desire to learn Greek and minimal desire to carry on with Latin. He just likes concrete, and he's quite happily studying that and having a brilliant time. Um, so classics is a really 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 broad church, and you know whatever your thing is, you will probably find it in classics. Amazing. Um, so Luna says, hi, I'm an international student applying for Classics 2 in English and my college does not offer Latin and Greek at A-level, although I have English Lit. What can I write about when it comes to the written work for Classics? And we could perhaps answer this more generally about written work all, all around. Lots of people always ask this question, um, understandably. Um, are Requirements in classics are extremely broad because, again, we know that not everyone applying to us um, will have done a classical subject at school. The important thing is that your written work from, from school or college should be a piece of written work you have done for school or college and has been marked by a teacher or lecturer and has not been done specially for Oxford. So don't worry about it. Look at what you've got or what you might be doing sort of in the course of your college work um, in, in the next um, few weeks. Um, and see what might be appropriate. What might be appropriate? Well, um, possibly something um, ab about literature, about a text, um, especially for classics and English, since it's such a literary degree. Um, but that could be a text in English, 
um, or in your, your native language, you mentioned you're an international student. I don't know if that means you're an English speaker. I don't know. Um, it could be anything. Um, in classics, we are absolutely used to marking things. I've had things in economics, you know, in history, whatever, um, because what we're looking for is basically um, your sort of, I mean, the, the criteria on, on the, the various admissions websites, um, as part, part of the faculty and, and, and the general Oxford admissions website, but um, your ability to express yourself, to make an argument, to respond to the text or whatever other thing it is you're responding to, um, all those skills that are transferable are, are across basically humanities. So, I mean, don't, don't send us some solved equations, but send us a, 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 a something, some sort of extended piece of writing um, about something vaguely humanities or, or even social sciences, um, and um, we'll absolutely be very pleased to see that. Yeah, I would 100% second Gail's point about something you're doing for school anyway. I'm sure you don't have time to write anything extra. I was doing science A-levels, so I didn't have a lot of extra writing. I did biology, chemistry, Latin and French, and for Latin and French, we weren't doing a lot of writing. But I know, I don't know if this is still the case, but I think you write a bit about what the work is. So one of the things I submitted was actually just an exam piece I'd done in Latin because we just didn't used to write a lot. So the only times we do writing was I think at the, you know, at some point we had an exam. So it was like under time conditions. So definitely not my best writing, but I kind of put that. I said, oh, this is something I wrote in 40 minutes under time conditions. And I'm sure, you know, the professors took that into account. I know for joint schools, I had to send in four pieces of written work, two for classics and two for French, and which sounds like a lot, but I did, <laughs> you can reuse them. I email, again, just ask questions. I emailed college and was like, hey, is it okay if I send this classics essay in for my French tutors? It's actually a philosophy type essay. I don't know, something like that. Um, so yeah, ask questions about the written work. You know, you can do that. And yeah, just some, something you're doing already. Like don't kind of spend too much time worrying about having to come up with a brilliant kind of essay in addition to your A-levels. <laughs> Okay, moving on now um, to Mark's question. Coming from Scotland, where Latin hires are a bit simpler than the English A-levels, um, I've had to learn the vocab and some grammar outside school for the CAT, the Classics Admissions Test. Might this limit my chances of being accepted? So I'm also from Scotland, um, and so I'll take this one. Um, basically, uh, I think what um, other people will say um, as well is that uh, firstly like your how well you do in the classic submissions test isn't the only thing that the tutors look at so they will look at an, your all-round application so maybe even if one part does happen to be slightly weaker than the other parts um, it doesn't really matter that much because as long as you show enthusiasm and have a good all-round uh, application then it doesn't it's not too bad if you if one part is lacking but I think that in the classic submissions test it isn't so much about knowing all the vocab and knowing all the grammar, because there's always going to be, even for people who did A-levels, so I know that hires, since in Scotland we start classics a bit later, so the vocab isn't as developed and they give a lot of vocab in lists in the exams, uh, so you don't end up learning as much. Uh, it's not even the English students don't know um, all the vocab that's going to be in a given extract, and often it is just um, whether you can work it out or what, how, like how the tutors can see your kind of logic getting to a certain point in deducting things. But yeah, no, I don't think it will limit your chances at all. I think, if anything, um, people are aware of the difference between syllables, syllabuses, um, and it will look good that you've um, gone out of your way and gone to learn things outside of school. But yeah, I would keep going and good luck. Brilliant. Uh, oh, hang on. There we go. Um, Lucin, uh, no, I'm going to go to the synonymous one. Will only certain colleges offer certain courses, for example, Classics 2 and English? I think the simple answer is yes, check the lists. Um, it is, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I, if, if I, I'll direct do people to particular places. I think um, if but, they're offering yeah. Classics, they'd offer both Course 1 and 2. And if they were offering a joint studies, it wouldn't matter if you're going to do course one or two with the joint studies. It would never be like you can only do course one in English. But for example, with I classics and oriental right. studies, with classics and oriental studies, um, not all colleges offer that. Um, so yeah, it is well worth. There are lots and lots of spreadsheets. I'm sure we can. There's a page. Uh, there's them. a there's a web page where you can look it up. Um, I'll pull it up afterwards and put it in the um, put it in the chat on the YouTube video. 
so that it'll be easy to find. So. That's brilliant, Edith. Thank you. Because yes, exactly. But I, I think there are sort of two questions here, and, and between course one and course two, I don't think um, colleges distinguish. So if they offer um, classics and modern languages, it would be any of the versions we've talked about. Um, if they offer classics in English, it would be either course one or course two. Um, where there is a bit of a difference is firstly, do colleges offer classics and oriental studies, classics and modern languages, classics in English at all? So that's the first thing to check. Um, and also, in modern languages, is it only in some languages? So, for instance, in Trinity, we only offer classics in modern, modern languages where the modern language is French or Spanish, because those are the subjects we have fellows in. Um, and um, with Oriental Studies, it's more likely to be the slightly abstruse question, um, which colleges offer classics with Oriental Studies, which is what we've mostly been talking about, where you do classics mods first, as Ezra did, um, or Oriental Studies with classics. Um, where you sort of start with Oriental Studies prelims, which is not a course I know much about. Uh, not so many colleges offer that, but some of them who are real experts in Oriental Studies do. And um, Lee Cindy's got another question, and again, I'll put a link in the YouTube chat afterwards. But um, what does the classics submission test include? So the link that I'll show, it, we've got some um, like workshop videos on like lots of people talking all the way through it, and there's... Um, past papers that people can look at, but would you like to like offer any memories or thoughts on what it was like when you did it? That, that really throws me back. <laughs> um, I think, you know, there was a question about not being prepared for the cat with Scottish hires, but even with A-levels, I learned like a lot of additional vocab <laughs> to, to do it. Um, I think, yeah, that I just, I just do your best right there's not really much else you can do like Eliza said you're not going to know all the vocab probably don't worry about it just give your best guess like that's what they're trying to see um and then yeah I, I don't know if there any that that was the main question just about the admissions test but um yeah that was my experience was I can't remember it that well and it, it was fine <laughs> And I guess there's the other, um, so I guess there's the aptitude test um, using the language itself if you've already done A-levels, um, but if you've not done Latin or Greek yet, um, so like I'm uh, my like A-levels by hand, um, you do instead a sort of language aptitude test, which is actually really fun. Um, you basically get a sort of linguistics problem solving paper and it's like they give you the rudiments of a language or like scraps of information and you've got to sort of try to answer questions, work things out. Um, and you're not really expected to know anything. Uh, it's just there to test. Can you think around corners and, you know, uh, sideways? And can you be inquisitive and creative when you're faced with a problem that you just don't have a straight answer to? Um, so I, I actually really quite enjoy the, um, the aptitude test. It's am really I, cool I, and it's not something you need to really stress about revising for if you're going for the course two version. Am I right in thinking it's a made up language they give you, Justin? Um, they do. They give you a bunch. Uh, I was actually, um, uh, it was quite cool. They gave us some medieval Welsh, actually, so, you know, a bit of representation. Um, but um, yeah, they give you all sorts. I think they give you uh, some ancient languages, some modern languages. Uh, they give you made up stuff as well. It's just, it's really, it's about testing the skills really like can you and the, the problem win. solving is i was going to yeah, say it's along the lines of they, they'll tell you a rule you know this is how this language works it differentiates between singulars and plurals in this way now try and work out how this rule is applied in these sentences from this language that you've never seen before or that is made up um so it's very much processing logical language based thoughts um and as i think we've said there are past papers available on the website so have a look at one of those if, if you're doing so that's the language aptitude test or see that um as opposed to just the cat which is just translate a piece of latin or greek if you have a latin or greek a level i will also add um if you're doing oriental studies and you haven't take you haven't ever learned the language which you're applying for you'll have to do the OLAT, which is the Oriental Languages Aptitude Test, which is very, very, very similar to the CLAT. But just in case you were thinking, because I do Latin or Greek, I won't have to take the CLAT. If you're applying for Oriental Studies, you will still have to do that, as you said, very problem solving, lateral thinking, um, sort of made up language paper. But yeah, just to warn you. And then the final admissions test I think we haven't spoken about is the French or German or Italian one, which Actually, having heard about this other, you know, the aptitude test sounds a lot more fun. I would, I would have liked some kind of random made up language or medieval Welsh. But as far as I remember, the French aptitude test, and there will be past papers online you can find, was pretty much, I think it was like 20 questions on grammar rules. It really wasn't that like kind of complicated. Um, so yeah, wouldn't worry about that. Just, just be jealous that other people are getting to, you know, 
translate medieval Welsh. <laughs> so moving on then, uh, Anonymous asks, if a student starts out in classics but develops an interest in Oriental studies, is it possible to switch to joint honours, for example, classics and Oriental studies? And what if the student's college doesn't offer Oriental studies? So it, it is um, possible and also it is also possible if you apply with Oriental Studies and then you decide you'd rather just stick with Classics, it's possible to switch back down. Um, it's obviously harder. You then have to make a separate application to the Oriental Studies um, sort of faculty. I don't know exactly what that will entail because I, I just applied with it straight from um, from year 13. But I don't, it, you know, it might include um, something similar or akin to the normal um, application process. If your college doesn't offer it, that might be a little bit more tricky and, and it might be the case that you you can't um, then decide to do it later. Or you might have to, yeah, I, I would imagine that if your college hasn't done it, that would be very much, much more complicated. But it is possible to, to do if your college offers or, uh, classics or into studies as well, to switch from classics to classics or into studies. Yeah, I think if you think this might be you, pick a college that does offer classics as oriented studies just in case. Um, you know, there have been cases of students wanting to change the subjects that their colleges doesn't offer and it all gets very fraught and the college has to decide, do we make this huge exception to allow this person to switch from English to biology? I've known it done um, or whatever. Um, so best to be on the safe side. But if you are at a college that offers both classics and classics and oriental studies, then yes, as Ezra says, um, I mean, certainly in my college, I have seen people change both ways um, after these these mods that you do in, in your second year that are entirely um, classics anyway. Um, and in terms of the application process, if you wanted to sort of add in oriental studies then, um, it's really fairly straightforward at that stage in my experience. It may vary from language to language. Um, the most important thing that the um, Faculty of Oriental Studies normally wants to know, as you would be picking up a new language then, is have you got the aptitude to learn a language? Um, obviously, if you've, um, the main way of telling that by two years into your degree as opposed to just submission. Um, is have you done okay at the classical languages you've been working at, um, particularly the, the marks you end up getting in language papers of classics mods, and normally if they're fine, um, then it, it's fairly easy then to, to, to move into classics and oriental studies at that stage. Thank you. Um, so, um, Lucindy also wondered, with doing classics in English, would you still be expected to do a language, or is that just with classics and other joints? Uh, in terms of if the language is Latin or Greek, uh, yes. Um, so um, Oxford Classics is basically language-based. Whatever version of it you do, there'll be a language in there somewhere. Um, and so um, with Classics in English, if you don't have either Latin or Greek already, um, then you pick either Latin or Greek um, and you do that um, as a main part of your degree and as I think we've already said you could also choose to do in the, the other language later um, we don't do a version of classics in English where you do the classical stuff in translation so um, just for all the people out there who are typing or thinking of typing I'm going to wrap this up in about five minutes so start typing now if you want to get your questions in um, William was wondering which colleges have the strongest cohort for classics and French in terms of quantity of undergraduate uptake? I'm not sure we know, do we? There must be statistics mm -hmm. out there. I mean, it varies a lot from year, year to year. Colleges don't, they certainly wouldn't have a quota for classics and French, and most don't have a quota for classics and modern languages. You know, they'd sort of have it. We can admit a certain number of classic students, and in a certain year, I mean, we want the best people. So you might get more um, classics and French available than even classics, and you might think, oh, we'll give one of our classics places to classics and French. That's how it sort of feels as a tutor. Um, so I'm not sure there's much more we can say. The, 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 all of joint schools, you know, you can see the overall numbers in the university, and you can see the number of colleges that offer them. They are quite a minority thing. There are sort of a, a few students scattered all over the place. So you'll be unlikely to find a college that's sort of got any large number of people studying classics, even and, and, and French, which is probably the, the biggest. Um, so I think that's probably about as far as I can get. But just to give you an idea of... of um, the, the sort of thing we're, we're talking about here, it, it's, you know, you're going to be lucky if there's one person in every year in your college doing classics and French, wherever you apply. Mm -hmm. 
normally on the websites for certain colleges it says sort of like for modern classics and modern languages we take one to two people per year but just to emphasize that this isn't like a fixed thing as Gail said it does sort of I don't know it's, it seems like classics in French um when it comes to the classic side at least are treated similarly to classics applicants so it's just like we have this many classics people a year sometimes there there's one or two uh, joint course people as well rather than we do have one classics in French person every year which is what some certain college websites seem to imply because that's what I looked at when I was applying I was like well Christchurch takes one to two so I was like oh maybe there's two maybe I got more chance of getting in but it wasn't like that but yeah that's really good advice thank you um and I'm sorry if you've answered already with joint schools do students do a mix of both courses all four years or are they done sequentially? Oh my goodness, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, we kind of, there, there is, again, distress, um, sort of different versions of the course. Uh, I'd recommend going on, again, the Classics uh, website for, I think there's four prospective students. We've got kind of a breakdown, a table of different courses. Overall, there are two versions. There's one that's four years in total, which Eliza and Justin do. Oh, sorry, Eliza does. And then me and Justin do a course, which is five years in total. So for the four years in total one, it's 50-50 classics and modern languages the whole way through, um, year abroad and third year. For the other course, five years, um, you do classics for the first five terms. So that's for the first year and then the first, so first year and a half, you do exactly the same as classicists, maybe a bit of French to keep it up. You do classics exams in the middle of your second year and then it's exactly the same half and half until the end of your degree um so that's the sort of overview of the of the split yeah look look, look as, as as anisha said look, look at the table for the different versions of classics in modern languages if it's classics in english things are a little bit simpler although there are still different versions of the degree um there's a three-year degree if you have a classical language to a level and in that case everybody does classics and english prelims at the end of their first year so you're doing both classics in English throughout the degree, both in prelims and in um, your two final years after that. There is also a four year classics in English course if you don't have Latin or Greek A-level. And there we do have a bit of sequentialism, but the other way, well, no, it's, more, it's still more classics basically, um, because then you have a preliminary year tacked onto the beginning of that three year course. So although this is a four year course, it's a completely different shape from the regular classics four year course. You have a preliminary year where you just intensively learn either Latin or Greek, maybe going to a few English lectures in the back, um, background uh, and have a preliminary exam at the end of that year just on that language you've been intensively learning and then you go into classics and English prelims um, as I just described along with people who've just come from school with Latin or Greek A level uh, and do classics and English throughout years two to four of your degree. And Ezra there's different choices with oriental studies as well aren't there? Yeah sorry to um, add even more information so if you're taking classics and oriental studies with classics as the main focus then you just follow a normal classics degree for your first two years up until mods. And then after that, you enter what's called grades, which are your final exams that you'll take in your fourth year. And normally you have eight options for grades. And if you're doing classics oriental studies, then you will replace three of those options with um, your oriental studies language. And the other five you will have to choose from um, the normal classics ones. So yeah, that's very much more sequential. You sort of follow the normal path for a classic student and then you add in your Oriental Studies language at the end. If you chose to do Oriental Studies in Classics, then it would kind of be the exact uh, opposite. You'd follow the normal um, course for the Oriental language that you're choosing, including probably a year abroad. And then you would pick up either Latin or Greek in your final two years. Um, so yeah, that one, I guess that's a little bit simpler than, than the others, but yeah. And we've got time for, I think, one, probably one last question. Uh, and this one's quite nice in general, and I think you'll all be able to contribute. What is the workload like? How many big essays and translations are there a week? Uh, as a tutor, I'm going to start off by saying it varies a lot. Um, and at different times of your course is, is, is the crucial thing. Um, and um, you will, in general, find that there's probably more language learning towards the beginning and fewer essays and more essays towards the end but also fewer things like writing pieces of, of translations and other language work but um, I know a workload question it really depends on how it feels as a student so students go ahead and uh, answer this question. And um, so one thing that can come up is if you're doing the mods route rather than the prelims route 
um, it can err towards getting a little bit um, heavier than it might otherwise do because you're doing the full time job of a classicist plus uh, sort of however much modern languages you're comfortable with. Um, I'm really lucky. So I'm at St. Hughes and my tutor, Tom Kuhn, for German is just a god amongst men and I love him. Uh, and he's basically just made the case um, with various teachers like, no, you can't ask Justin to do this. Like he's doing a full degree as well. Like uh, so, um, for example, up to mods, um, I would be doing like one so la hour of language learning for Latin every morning, uh, maybe one tutorial essay a week, maybe two and then some uh, sort of a scattering of like smaller classes and that develops more into like doing lots of scattered small classes which is what I'm doing at the moment with like one big um, essay a week uh, but up until mods before it kind of split off into being sane um, I would also I was able to like sit in on German tutes so I knew what people were talking about I'd do maybe two three language or grammar classes a week um, but you're not you're not looking at murderous amounts it's just you kind of there are times when you will just be drinking coffee and powering through on enthusiasm but it's incredibly rewarding um and it is kind of what you make of it um and especially the great thing about doing classics and modern languages particularly and i guess it may be the same for the others is that you're really free to choose your own path um there are so many i mean i, I tried running the numbers once it's getting to several hundreds of combinations you could do maybe even into the thousands because uh, there are so many different varied papers and you basically just got your pick of this like mad buffet of two huge subjects. Um, so in terms of specifics, uh, I'm not sure uh, you're probably looking at eight, nine ish to like maybe 12 ish hours of contact a week. But that really, really, it varies, depends where you are in your course, what you're doing. Um, it'll never be too insane. And your tutors are there to make it manageable and you will never be asked to do something that's actually impossible. But um, yeah, it, it, it is kind of what you want to make of it, how much work you want to set yourself. But at the end of the day, it really is rewarding. I think the other general point perhaps is just to remember that Oxford's assessment system is still quite based on final exams, although different bits of the courses we're talking about include options to do assessed ex extended essays, whereas of coursework essays basically, or to write a dissertation. But that means that when we say one or two essays a week, that doesn't mean an essay that you're going to be marked on that's going to add up, that's going to count towards your degree. Um, it means what you've learned in your reading that week and are putting forward to discuss in your tutorial, and then the next week you'll do another one, and they become not something to agonise about. Brilliant answers and brilliant questions for everyone was typing in there. I'm going to wrap it up there so we can go and get ready for our next live stream, uh, which is at 11 o'clock and it's focusing on straight classics. And I hope some of you will come and join us there as well. Um, but I'm just going to finish with a um, huge thank you to Gail, Ezra, Eliza, Justin and Anisha. Thanks for your time this morning. And we hope to see uh, some applications from some of you who are out there watching. Good luck, everyone. Yeah, good luck. Good luck. Go smash it. <laughs> <laughs>